There's one more part we need to add, and that's what I call the statistical string. The first part of the statistical string is we say what test we used. In this case, we used a t-test. And then in parentheses, we'll put our degrees of freedom. Now, remember what our degrees of freedom were. We can look here, our degrees of freedom from our output was 11. So in our parenthesis, we put t, it's an italicized t, and then parenthesis 11 and parenthesis with no space. Then we put a space, an equal sign, a space, and then we look up at step number 5 to see what our t comp was, and we write that value. And even though we're going by the absolute value, we still put the negative sign here. It's very important that we do put it here. And then we put a comma. And then we put the p-value. Remember where we get the p-value. The p-value in our case is 0 0.103. We'll put p equals 0.1032. Now, if you hadn't used Excel, you wouldn't know what the p-value was. But you would know that since we reached we failed to reject, the p must have been greater than 0.05. If we could have rejected, we, it would have been less than 0.05. But in this case, we failed to reject, so it must have been greater than 0.05. Remember how this works. As we first set our alpha at 0.05, that's the most we're willing to be wrong. And if we can reject the HO with a probability less than that, we do it. But if our probability goes over 0.05, we just can't afford to do it. So next, the next thing in our t-string is we put a tell everybody that it's a two-tell test. And we put that in parentheses. Now, not every test is one or two-telled. Some tests, that doesn't really apply. But when it does apply, we try and tell the people what it is. Now, not all conclusions have to be written in one sentence. Actually, in most articles, you would say what your means are. You give a lot of results other than just this conclusive statement. But somewhere, you do need to say what the alpha level is. Now, sometimes a research article will run many tests. So it'll just say, for all, for all tests, the alpha was 0.05. And then it'll state each one separately without saying again what the alpha level is. But the first thing they need to do is say what the alpha level is at least once. And then you have to say what your decision is. And then you have to give the string so people know what kind of statistics you did end up with. This is what it looks like with all seven steps all together. So we start out with our HO, our null hypothesis. Then we have our alternative hypothesis. Then we have our alpha. We have our rejection rule. We have our test statistic our TCOMP, then our decision. It's either fail to reject HO or it's reject HO. And then we have our conclusion, which is in these three parts. Now, I do have a few warnings that I, that I want to go over with you. One of those is, and I mentioned we would go over this. When you're doing functions, instead of using this uh, data analysis tool, you never include the cells that have the labels. You just tell it the cells that have the data. So that's easy to uh, get into that habit when you come up to this data analysis, is to actually just list those that have the data. So in this case, the cells that have the data are A2 down to A7, and then B2 down to B8. Now that's fine, but if you do that, and then also check labels, then you'll get a funny answer. What will happen when you do that is at the top of your data, instead of saying clinic A and clinic B, what it'll say is it'll give your first data point. It thinks 3.23 is a label, not a number. It thinks 3.22 is a label, not a number. So it labels your columns with those. And it doesn't include them in the observations. So instead of having six observations per clinic A, we only have five. And instead of having 7 for clinic B, we only have 6. So be very careful. Whenever you do this kind of analysis, kind of look at your table labels to make sure that those labels match the labels you expect. 
If your labels are numbers, you've probably done it wrong. Another thing that might happen is you might put A2 to A7, B2 to B8, and then not include labels. A lot of people do that. They like doing that because that's the way they do it for functions, so they do it the same way when they're using data analysis. And that'll give you the right answers. The only thing it'll do is since uh, Excel doesn't know what to call each one of your columns, it just calls the first column variable 1 and the second uh, column variable 2. And unless you remember what variable 1 is and variable 2 is, you can get confused. So I always like to include the labels, but you don't need to. You can run it this way, and it always works out just fine if you do that. So I think that's uh, it for the labels. Let's see. Uh, oh, one other warning. Here I mentioned that the variances here were quite different. There are ways to test your variances to see if they differ significantly. And if they do differ significantly, then you need to use the t-test assuming unequal uh, variances. We don't do that in this class, but I, I just want you to know that when it gets up to four or five times as much variance for one as the other, then it might be problematical. Um, I did test this for significance, and they aren't significantly different. But it still might be problematical. And it might be more conservative to do the t-test for assuming unequal variances. That's a more conservative test, less likely to be significant, even with the same data, it would be less likely to be significant if you use that. Um, but you're less open to criticism if you have variances.